I'm Gilbert. I am a health services researcher and health policy researcher by training. And today I'm going to uh, present some research on uh, how public policy influences health and access to care for LGBTQ populations and uh, the, the large role that discrimination plays. Before I get started, I just want to put in a, a quick plug on the uh, Vanderbilt LGBTQ plus policy lab. So if there are any postdocs in the room or if you know of any uh, PhD students who will be graduating and interested in doing LGBTQ health and policy research, uh, we'll be hiring two postdocs a year for at least the next five years. Um, and we have a wide range of interdisciplinary scholars. Um, Kit Carpenter is our, our director. He's an economist. Uh, Tara McKay is a sociologist and I'm a health services researcher and we are uh, the associate directors. You can see our fabulous team here uh, on this slide. And happy to stick around after the, today's talk if you're interested in, uh, in LGBT health and policy uh, work. Um, <clears throat> So today's talk, I'm, I'm going to try to divide this into three different sections. Uh, first, just giving us a, a baseline understanding on LGBTQ health and what we've learned in the last decade when uh, new and credible and good data on sexual orientation or gender identity, also known as SOGI, has come out in some of our big national surveys. And then I'll uh, talk a little bit about how public policy influences health and access to care and then uh, lastly, I will present some work in progress on the role of discrimination in health. And that's uh, very preliminary work and something that could really benefit from your feedback and suggestions you have uh, to, for me to take back to my team to try to improve. Um, so first, just some background. Um, and some of the best data sets we have, about 9 to 12 million adults in the U.S. identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and or transgender. Um, this is probably an undercount. Um, this relies on data where people have to come out and, and disclose their sexual orientation in, in a big uh, CDC national data set. Um, it's still a pretty large population. This could be the size of New Jersey or Georgia or Illinois, um, but it's a pretty sizable population that's gaining more uh, uh, attention in, in the policy spaces. Um, the second point on this on this slide is that it really it wasn't until 2011 when our federal government for the first time uh, identified and targeted for uh, for elimination disparities health disparities affecting uh, LGBTQ populations. Uh, the NIH uses sexual and gender minorities, the SGM acronym, uh, for describing this population. I prefer to use LGBTQ uh, because that's what my community partners recognize. Uh, the LGBTQ uh, community rather than at the S SGM uh, population. So throughout this talk, they, they're interchangeable, but I prefer to use LGBTQ. Um, in, the, in this big 2011 report, um, you can see pictured here, um, it identified a wide range of disparities. And I don't want to focus on all of these, but I'll just call attention to two of these that I'm, I'm, I'm predominantly, I'm, I'm primarily concerned about. And the first is on uh, the B group, bisexuals. And in study after study, uh, we see that bisexuals, they tend to report worse health outcomes across the board, worse than uh, their straight or heterosexual peers, but also worse health and, and uh, just adverse outcomes, even compared to their gay and lesbian counterparts. Um, and study after study, and I'll show some data here, they, they have higher levels of depression and anxiety. Uh, we see that they are more likely to be homeless or more likely to be living in poverty and unemployed or underemployed. Um, and this is probably for two reasons. Uh, they, bisexuals not only experience uh, uh, homophobia from the broader society, but they also experience biphobia from within the LGBTQ community. There's not a lot of uh, bi, uh, bisexual specific or bi-specific community organizations. Uh, there's not a lot, um, a lot of uh, targeting for uh, resources for bisexuals. Um, and many of them, most of them, if they do get married or decide to get married, many of them are in uh, different sex or opposite sex relation marriages where they may, where if a bi man um, is, is probably more likely to be married to a, uh, a woman, uh, but they're, they, they're, they tend to be more in uh, different sex relationships, which can hide their identities. Um, and so I think many, some of them will struggle with their bisexual identities when, when, when experiencing those relationship patterns. The other group that I want to just point out as a high priority group on this list are the are, is our transgender and gender nonconforming, non-binary, gender queer populations. Um, this is uh, a group that where we finally we finally have good data uh, from the CDC, and in study after study, 
they are uh, showing remarkable and, and, and unacceptable levels of psychological distress, self-harm, suicidal ideation, um, HIV, STI rates, uh, homelessness. Uh, this is a group that is gaining traction in policy. Unfortunately, in recent years, we've seen more anti-transgender policies impacting this group in terms of access to care. Um, but if someone were to ask me, what are the priorities in LGBTQ health or who are the priority populations, I would always recommend folks to um, that we need more research and more programs for uh, the B and the T group. Um, not that the G and the L and, and the Qs are, 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 are less important, but I think that this is uh, understudied and gains less focus and attention in, in uh, media and in research. Um, so why do LGBTQ health disparities exist? Uh, in the uh, sexual and gender minority research space, the prevailing theme is minority stress theory. And this postulates that discrimination and stigma and harmful public policies, it, can, it stigmatizes LGBTQ people, um, which facilitates feelings of re rejection, shame, low self-esteem, uh, oftentimes internalized homophobia, expectations of rejection from their families or from people they work with. Uh, but this in turn uh, negatively shapes uh, their health and their health related behaviors. And this happens across the life course. Um, starting in second and third grade, LGBTQ youth uh, are, are oftentimes bullied in school. Um, as they uh, uh, move into adulthood, they may be uh, fired or not hired for a job because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And even as they age, uh, many of them will have to go back into the closet uh, should they need uh, any long-term care services and supports like nursing homes or other long-term care facilities. Um, so unfortunately, this impacts uh, LGBTQ people across the life course. Oh, have a yeah, please, please. I was wondering, has this? Do you feel like this has changed with Gen Z and like them being a lot more open and aware about different, yeah, gender identities and um, well, stuff? What I can say is that uh, in high school surveys uh, on LGBTQ youth, we still see high levels of psychological distress. Those disparities have not gone away. They've narrowed a little bit given attitudinal changes uh, among middle and high schoolers, but those disparities have not gone away yet. How it plays out across your life, we can look at that. Hope, maybe, hopefully, you still do that 50 years from now, <laughs> or 30 to 50 years from 30 years from now, and and I'll probably be retired and on Medicare. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> Uh, the, the, that life course process. So please feel free to ask questions and supply comments along the way. I, I, it's fun for me if there's a conversation. Um, so there's this discrimination and stigma harm, but there's also issues on the healthcare side. Uh, we know that LGBTQ people have higher uh, levels of uninsurance, uh, workplace discrimination may uh, and harassment may lead to jobs without health insurance. Employers have historically not provided insurance for same-sex partners and spouses. Even now, after Obergefell v. Hodges, roughly 75% uh, of employers cover same-sex spouses. Um, some employers are exempt from, uh, from federal and state laws where they don't uh, have to cover same-sex married couples, but it's gotten better. When I started this work uh, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago-ish, this was closer to about 30 to 40%, so it has gotten better, but not all employers are covering same-sex spouses. <clears throat> There are also issues among LGBTQ young adults, those 18 to 25 year, year group. Um, and uh, parents may choose to disown or not include LGBTQ young adults on their health insurance plans. And we know that having health insurance in the United States is fundamental to accessing health care given its price and, and the cost of health care in the US. Um, there's still provider side uh, issues with accessing LGBTQ affirming health care. Not all doctors are trained on LGBTQ health topics. Uh, what, if I were to ask the group, what is the national average? If, if medical school is four years, what's the national average on LGBTQ health curriculum across those four years? 60 minutes. Bingo, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's usually someone like me come willing, willing myself into uh, a lecture hall uh, and giving a talk like this for 60 minutes and that's, probably what is the average across the United States that's, that is, is required. Uh, more progressive uh, medical schools uh, like NYU, like Vanderbilt are now offering elective courses, but the national average is probably close to an hour. 
Um, and so it's hard to find an LGBTQ affirming doctor when a patient is looking for someone uh, who is affirming, they're hard to find online. Um, and even when, you know, when, when transgender or sexual minority people are looking for an, an affirming provider or access, accessing care, a doctor who may not be bigoted or uh, prejudiced, um, they just don't know how, what, how to respond when a trans patient or a sexual minority patient says, I need a pap test. Um, and so not that the doc, not that doctors are bigoted, but they just may not be informed or educated on these topics. And so it's getting better. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How do you find an affirming, because it's hard to find a black provider, but I know how to do that, pictures. How do you find a, a, an affirming provider? I think there are three ways. One, you just Google it. And there are some, do they have like, I'm a, I'm a say like how people have a safe space. Like what do they have? Like, do they? <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association has a website where they list okay. any doctors that want to volunteer their name for, to be in a, an LGBT affirming provider. So that usually comes up in Google searches. Um, sometimes health, uh, health facilities or systems will have an LGBTQ health office or a program. Uh, to, so at Vanderbilt, we have the program for LGBTQ health. That's usually an, an entry point for LGBTQ patients. They call Delray Zimmerman, I'm gay, I'm looking for a gay-friendly doctor, and then they get navigated to one within the Vanderbilt Health, health System. Um, the other, uh, and, and the third way is word of mouth. That is the most popular way among, within LGBTQ communities to find an LGBTQ doctor. So I have an LGBTQ affirming doctor. Can I ask another question? Yeah, yeah please. How many, or you probably don't know, but I, I guess I'm interested in what percent of affirming doctors are not part of the community? Am I, is my question make sense? Yes, a lot. Okay. So my doctor is not part of the community. He's LGBTQ affirming. It took me about three primary care providers to find him. And it was just random that I did find him. He was trained in Norway. Uh, his, his name is, 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 is Thor. <laughs> trained in Norway. <laughs> we're about the same age. And he DJs at the gay bar on weekends. <laughs> and it's like, it's been the best primary care experience I've ever had in my life. And, and now through word of mouth, I send my friends to, to Thor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Thor? <laughs> No hammer, no hammer. It's like, people don't believe you, but he's actually, he's, he does exist. <laughs> so word of mouth. And a lot of them are not always, a lot of them are, uh, a, a lot of them are cisgender women. Um, I've just I've worked in a medical school, so I would just imagine given the population of who graduates, it would it be enough members of the community to serve everyone? So I'm just wondering. Like, yeah, and we don't have those good, the, good statistics yet on, on the diverse, that uh, sexual and gender minority diversity within uh, medical school graduates. Yeah. I was going to say, like, health insurance programs now will recommend doctors too. Oh, so fantastic. Like, like, like United Healthcare. Okay. You can call and, and they'll have like patient reviews and stuff for specific. They actually do because I asked for a black uh, therapist and they were oh. able to give me a list of. Yeah. So I'm sure that's nice. Just, I'm sure you could ask. I didn't know that. mental health resources for LGBT as well. So it was easy to find them. So. Mm -hmm. At least in New York City. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, no, they don't have um, okay, so there's uh, issues on the uh, discrimination and societal side, but there's also healthcare issues. Here are just some data that uh, came out uh, that that we reported on in 2016, and this was this is relied relies on data that came out in the uh, CDC's National Health Interview Survey, and this was the first time that the CDC's NHIS added sexual orientation uh, to our main national health survey, and that wasn't until 2013, not that long ago. Um, but these are some of uh, just some baseline uh, and descriptive uh, disparities. And, and you can see that heterosexuals or straight uh, adults are in these gray bars, gay and lesbian are in gold bars, and the bisexuals are in these uh, black bars. And when you, there's a couple of takeaways. Um, bisexuals, again, um, are more likely to report any psychological distress. This relies on Kessler's uh, six item question. How often in the past 30 days did you feel blue, sad? Um, <coughs> everything took a lot of effort, um, but almost half of bisexual uh, men and women are reporting psychological distress, about uh, a quarter of uh, gay and lesbian adults. Um, the other uh, uh, feature, or the other uh, statistic that is, I think is troublesome is current cigarette use. Um, about a quarter of 
uh, gay, like lesbian and bisexual adults are or were current cigarette smokers when these data were collected. Um, some of this can be uh, as a coping mechanism. Uh, some of it could be just socialization at gay bars and smoking to make friends and, and to uh, create a peer network. Um, but these are just some baseline uh, stats. I'm going to pause here for questions, and then I'm going to, and then I'd like to transition into LGBTQ policies. Questions about just baseline LGBTQ health disparities. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've been spending the last eight to 10 years or so thinking about uh, LGBTQ specific policies like marriage equality. My dissertation focused on uh, same sex marriage laws. Um, and I just want to remind the room that LGBTQ people, we've won uh, major victories uh, in the last decade or two. I know it doesn't feel like it right now, um, but when I was born in the 80s, HIV, uh, the HIV epidemic uh, was still rampant. Uh, homosexuality was still considered uh, a diagnostic disorder in, in, uh, in, in some parts of medicine. It, but it's, uh, same sex sexual activities were still criminalized until 2003 uh, with the Supreme Court Lawrence v. Texas case. Um, uh, in 2004, with the election of George W. Bush, half the country in, uh, wrote into their state constitutions that same-sex marriage was illegal in their state constitutions. So when we take a, a longer view, uh, we've made a lot of progress in the last uh, couple of decades, um, including more recently at the, at the Supreme Court level, Obergefell v. Hodges, which legalized uh, same-sex marriage in all 50 states. So here's the rollout of marriage equality um, across the country. Massachusetts was the first state to legalize uh, same-sex marriage in 2004. Uh, you can see some, some states trickle in. New York adopted marriage equality in 2011 uh, through the uh, state legislature. Uh, some of these are random, like Iowa. Iowa's Supreme Court said, hey, same-sex couples can get married in the state of Iowa. Um, but then there were a couple of Supreme Court cases uh, in, in 2013, uh, U.S. v. Windsor uh, ruled that Section 3 of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional, and DOMA defined uh, marriage between one man and one woman. Anybody remember who signed DOMA into law? What president? Clinton. Who said that? Clinton. Bingo. Yes, yes. Bill Clinton signed DOMA into law, and I think we, we sort of footnote that in, in American history, uh, defining marriage between one man and one woman. Um, but in 2015, uh, Obergefell v. Hodges mandated same-sex marriage in the remaining 13 states, the typical culprits, uh, places like Kentucky and Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Texas, and Alabama. From a health services research perspective, we like to see a chart that looks something like this um, because we can leverage the variation in timing and, and geography, spatial geography, uh, to do some quasi-experimental designs. Uh, like a difference in differences analysis of any of you have taken a, a health economics or health or econometrics uh, course. Um, so this slide uh, summarizes what I think is are, is the, are the best uh, studies on the effects on, of same-sex marriage on LGBTQ health. And so um, there have been a few studies. There's also some internationally, but these just focus on what's been done in the U.S using population-based data sets that's representative of the population um, with a quasi-experimental difference in differences type of design. And so what we find, or what others have found, is that when California uh, legalized marriage equality, psychological distress uh, went down for those who were married uh, after uh, California uh, legalized marriage equality. In Massachusetts, uh, this is based off of one healthcare facility, Fenway Health. If anybody's familiar with, with Finway in Boston, um, this found that uh, sexual minority men had fewer mental health care visits in uh, within the state of, of Massachusetts. Again, just isolated to Finway patients, uh, but there's pretty good evidence that mental health care visits uh, uh, went down. And then two studies that I, I either led or co-led uh, found that uh, once uh, New York uh, passed marriage equality in 2011, there were health insurance uh, gains and improvements predominantly for men and same-sex couples. Um, and then when we look at all of those 50 states um, using CDC data, we find that health insurance improved and access to care improved uh, for men and same-sex households 
uh, looking at all 50 states when they legalize marriage equality. If, 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 if uh, someone were to ask me to summarize the literature, I would make two points. One, I'm not quite confident that uh, mental health has seriously improved following the passage of marriage equality. There have been a couple of studies that found mental health improvements, but even in, in this study, we didn't find that to be the case. And there have been a few other where, where findings have been null. So I, I, I would say that the evidence is mixed on mental health, but I'm pretty confident that marriage equality um, has improved health insurance coverage and access to care, meaning uh, fewer financial barriers to care. I feel pretty confident with that literature and those findings, which makes more sense to me. If I can get married to Bob, uh, we get married and I add Bob to my employer's health plan and Bob gets better health insurance. Mm -hmm. So that, those, that direct mechanism is easy, is an easier, uh, uh, is easier to see than, than the mental health outcomes. Michael. I was curious about the, uh, the mental health care visits, um, at least with the men, and I was wondering if, like, what might be the reason, like, one obviously is that they just, like, are, everyone just like, feeling better, another option is that, like, talking to their partner, which is now legal, you know, like, I don't, I was curious if you had any. So this is something that I am also trying to trying to figure out and trying to tease out in the data, you know. And the other thing is that we're finding that a lot of these effects are for men, sexual minority men, oftentimes in relationships. So this is a question for the group: Why why are men and same sex same sex couples benefiting from marriage equality, and we don't see the same <coughs> effects for women? Yeah. Is there any difference in employer benefits? Tell me more. And I'm, 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 you probably know that the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering, based off of like what the, what jobs the women are having then bring on their partners compared to the men, is there any difference? There's also differences in the type of healthcare. Like many women want fertility care, yep. which is, isn't often covered in different yep. types of insurance, yeah. right? So those are the different types of care. I guess I was wondering, I would think the mental health improvements that come along with marriage equality would be less about the law, but more about the societal acceptance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. That came with the. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying the law didn't impact that, but I think when I think of mental health, I think about how people are treated in, yeah. in space, <laughs> um, and I think we've become as a society more socially accepting of. I mean, we, I live in the village. I feel like we're here accepting of everyone, but. Um, I lived in Missouri where like they were accepting of no one, yeah. right? And so it, it yeah. has become more socially accepted. Yeah, uh, so that, that, the, yep, yes and yes. And it's so hard to tease out in data because uh, acceptance leads to better policies, but that but we also know that policies leads to greater acceptance. So there's like this, this, this two way uh, 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 yeah. effects, yeah, yeah. I think some evidence from European countries yes. um, that also implemented um, same-sex marriage in a sort of staggered way um, in the ones I have, uh, where um, th th there's one one paper um, I believe that shows quite nicely how um, acceptance in the general population based on population representative surveys yes um, actually improved quite significantly after a country introduced same-sex marriage. So that speaks to that mechanism that you were just talking That's about. That's my colleague Kit Carpenter's paper, yes, yeah, the, yes. yes. Laws or policies um, influencing um, yes. people's attitudes. And I think the, the link from attitudes in the general, general population to mental health among especially male sexual minorities, I think that link is quite easily okay. Okay. established. Okay, yeah, and I think we should do more work as more countries and, uh, and, and, and more countries um, address same-sex marriage. We see that, and hopefully we just need that good data to, to, to study the issue. I guess the other thing I yeah. would think about is, even if you're accepted for your sexual minority status as a woman, you still do with all the things about being, right? So these are, I mean, I guess I'm looking at the picture of white man. I'm like, okay, so now if, I, if I'm a white man and I'm gay, if, I, if the gay thing becomes acceptable, then I'm just a white man. Exactly. Right? So, <laughs> there is some intersectionality to this, I think. Uh, so first, to answer Brennan's, Brennan, is that right? Brennan's uh, thoughts, we know that two men make more money than two women when they're coupled together. So but that, that probably means that two men probably have more options on health insurance uh, than, than, than women. So maybe they're less likely to have one partner with 
an employer sponsored insurance plan that they can add their, their new wife to. Um, I'm wondering if there are also differences with like two gay men. Is it easier for Bob and Roger to say, hey boss, can I add Roger to my health plan now and, and just fill out the forms compared to let's say Lindsay and Lacey. Um, I don't know what those differences are, but this is like, these are like qualitative type questions that I, that I have and I'm trying to explore and try to find funding to explore those topics too. Yeah. There are also interesting, there's restrictions applied to employer-based healthcare for women and waiting periods that may not necessarily be a barrier for men, particularly oh. surrounding concerns about, is she going to come get this job, immediately get pregnant and then uh. leverage these benefits? And so, you know, we've experienced that as women, these waiting periods don't even phase a man because it's not a process that they're going to be worried Employment about. Employment-based sexism is real, it's rampant, yes. And it does lead to uh, decisions and who gets hired. Yeah, so sexism is something that is carrying out through this, this narrative. I fully agree. Um, any other questions, comments? This is, I love this, this is great. Um, so in 2014, I wrote a perspective in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. There are postdocs and PhD students in the room. This is a, a good way of getting your thoughts and your, your perspective into peer-reviewed and high-impact, well-read peer-reviewed studies. So in 2014, <coughs> I wrote a perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine recommending uh, that we need same-sex marriage, and I even call it a prescription for better health. And I... Uh, make my argument why marriage equality, this is before the Obergefell case, why marriage equality is important uh, for LGBTQ health. And reading it now in 2022, I feel like I was, I was not all the way right. Yes, we needed marriage equality, but it wasn't the, uh, uh, it wasn't the, just the, the, uh, the what's, what's that? The panacea. Yeah, it wasn't the, yeah, the panacea. Yeah, there wasn't the panacea that I thought it would be. Um, it, you know, we, yes, we have marriage equality, but mental health disparities, health disparities, barriers to care have not just disappeared between uh, LGBTQ populations and their uh, cis and straight uh, counterparts. So I sort of cringe um, when reading this, but I'm still thinking about policy as an important intervention. And if policy is a prescription, maybe the dosage isn't strong enough. So we need more than just marriage equality. We need to increase that dosage. Um, but what does that look like? I think it looks like something like the Equality Act, which has passed the House of Representatives, but has not gone through the US Senate, the Equality Act. Um, this was passed a couple of years ago. And this will ban discrimination in five settings, in employment, in housing, in public accommodation, so trains and planes, hotels, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, and financing and crediting, and in education. And so I think we need to tar like, use public policy to, um, to, to uh, prohibit discrimination in those settings. So that way people feel safe in all aspects of their life, at work, at school, um, seeking healthcare. Um, so we've tried to explore what happens to disparities when <clears throat> when sexual minorities live in, a, live in a state with what I call comprehensive uh, protections against discrimination in those five areas. So we studied this here, um, and these are the results. And this is available in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. It's, and it's open access, so you should be able to download it and share it with your community partners uh, anywhere. But we look at state level disparities in just one outcome, poor and fair health. So this is, asked, this is when you're, uh, a participant is asked, how good is your health? And they say it's poor or fair compared to excellent, very good or good. Uh, men are on the left, women are on the right. And these are just uh, sexual minorities and the CDC's behavioral risk factor surveillance system. These, uh, round, uh, these, these the round dots are uh, straight adults and the diamonds represent sexual minorities. And uh, this is going from zero to 30% of poor or fair health. So I'll just pick on one state. Who am I picking on today? Uh, how about Maryland? In the state of Maryland, about 15% of straight adults say that their health is poor or fair, and 22% of sexual minority men say that their, uh, that their, their health is uh, uh, poor or fair. Um, so you can see that this is the disparity here. Um, few takeaways. Um, you can see that there are wide disparities 
in places like Rhode Island uh, between uh, straight men and sexual minority men. But in some places like Massachusetts and California, sexual minority men are doing better than their, than their straight male counterparts. Um, these are also states that we expect this to happen uh, because these are places that have comprehensive protections against discrimination. There's some random uh, places and we checked to make sure we had enough sample size. I think this is restricted to, uh, to ensure that we have at least 100 sexual minorities in each of these states. So it's a reasonable sample size, but there are places that stand out like Kentucky. Where I see, I see Mike like, what is going on? Kentucky where, where uh, sexual minorities tend to do better than, uh, than, than their straight peers. I don't know, but maybe there's like a resiliency story. If I'm a sexual minority man in Kentucky, I have to be resilient to survive and to, and to do well. But anyway, you can see th this here. And when we look at um, whether living in a state with comprehensive protections uh, in those five arenas matters in these disparities, what we find is that those disparities are narrower. So are narrower uh, for sexual minority men when gay and bisexual men live in a state with comprehensive protections against discrimination, those disparities are narrower compared to uh, men in states with fewer protections or limited protections. Is race a confounder here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. I think you can explain why Kentucky is the way it is. Yeah, and the only thing yes. I can think of is race. Let me, let me get to the way <laughs> and then we can talk about everything that's wrong with this. <laughs> yes, yes. The answer is obviously yes, Gilbert. <laughs> and so, but when we look at women, it doesn't matter whether sexual minority women live in a state with comprehensive protections or not, the disparities are still there, regardless of the policy environment. You can see, if you, if you, you can see that the disparities, you see more bars over here on the, on the women's side than on the men's side. Race is certainly uh, a factor here. Unfortunately, you know, with the, the available data sets we have, we can't slice and, uh, and slice this by race, just given small sample sizes, but I hope 30 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm trying to remember Kentucky and I'm like, it's probably worse to be a black man in oh, Kentucky. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yeah. So black men versus white men, what could this look like? Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out like, is it just who's in the like who is in the heterosexual group versus yeah. who's in the, the LGBT group? Yeah. But it's sorting. Exactly. What did you say, Diana? I said in some way you also may have the sorting idea, which is that people may people who choose who choose to stay may have richer and fuller yeah. uh, and tighter social networks. Emily, yeah. you know, then you know, if you if you're choosing, if you because the option is you could leave for some people, and so the choice to so you may have sorting in some of these states that that pro that that, that is that can be confounding as well, um, and I think that one's a really hard one to to think about. Except you could go to the youth side, the very the youth side where there isn't that same option of leaving and moving, and it's not that everybody has that option. But sorting is one of these issues that that we have to figure out a way to deal with when we're talking at, at a state level. But yeah, and a study I'm working on now is trying to find data a data set on college students to because what happens if two sexual minority let's say women in Phoenix Arizona go to college and out of state and one goes to New York and the other goes to Arkansas, what are their eventual health outcomes? And, and like in, in the next and like in a pivotal moment in their adulthood, young adulthood, 18 to 25. It's like that's a that's a study that I'm trying to uh, find data and funding for. Everybody has ideas on the data sets. You had a question? No, I just wanted to, if that's okay, yeah. just comment on what Professor Silver just said, because I think I think that's a uh, great comment. And I think the sorting issue also goes the other way, because the, the sexual minority individuals that move to places like California concentrated in a few urban areas um, or to places like New York, New York City, are by no means a representative yeah. slice of the sexual minority population. They're disproportionately wealthy. Um, they're disproportionately healthy yep. um, also. Um, so that is one thing to take in mind when interpreting um, estimates for states like also Massachusetts, California. Uh, where's New York? Okay, in New York, it's the, the disparity is yeah. the, the, the other yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so 
I think we just need larger longitudinal data sets in order to this effect. Bingo. Yeah, I agree. One thousand percent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say like income probably plays a role because you see it like on the top. You have like Kentucky. Yeah, West Virginia. Oh, the poor states are at the top. With overall worse health. Oh, okay. Yeah. Worse rates. Yeah. Yeah. So like I was thinking about like maybe probably income plays a plays a role if um if you're starting if you have less like income you're gonna have um, worse outcomes in general. So they're probably starting higher. Yeah. And less opportunity to move. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I've talked a little bit about policy. I'm pretty convinced that a few policies, some policies matter, uh, but we're not seeing complete elimination of disparities. And, uh, and so I'm, uh, are there any PhD students in the room? Yeah, several. Several? <laughs> several? So when I was a PhD student, I learned about the methods that I'm going to introduce you now. I haven't had time to use these methods until like eight years into my career. So if, you, if you're introduced to a topic or a methodology, write it down, create your Google uh, document, and just keep putting your ideas there because eventually you'll find time to, uh, to uh, uh, go back and use those data sets, those methods, uh, and, and those theories that you learn in grad school. So, um, so this, net, this last part of my conversation is, is uh, a work in progress, and I could really benefit from your feedback, any suggestions you have on this part of my talk. So I want to try to quantify, I want to try to first estimate how big is the mental health disparity between sexual minorities and heterosexuals? We know that it's pretty large, um, but I want to use some methods that I'll introduce you to in a second to try to decompose that disparity between what we can explain uh, by observable characteristics in a data set and what we cannot explain uh, because we don't measure it in a survey. And there's many things we don't ask in surveys, such as discriminate experiences of discrimination, stigma, um, and just outness for sexual minorities. Um, so what we find, uh, and these are very preliminary findings, but about half, 45 to 65% of mental health disparities in the US are unexplained by <coughs> observable characteristics. So this is the method that I'm gonna rely on today, uh, Oaxaca blinder uh, uh, decomposition, which is uh, commonly used in economics. To, if you're a sociologist, you may also add Duncan or uh, uh, Katagawa, um, they're uh, just different discipline using these I same methods. Peters and Belsen. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, 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 exactly. These disciplines don't talk to each other. And so because I learned this from an economist, I call it Oaxaca blinder uh, decomposition. Exactly. But oftentimes disciplines just don't talk to each other and they're using the same thing. Yeah, so I'm going to just refer to this as Oaxaca blinder decomposition analyses because uh, my uh, my advisor uh, Sam Sam Myers was a health economist. I was a, an economist. Uh, this has been heavily used in uh, the discipline of economics, um, primarily to decompose wage and employment outcomes uh, to try to see how much uh, uh, how much of the uh, male female wage gap could be attri attributable attributable. I'm from the South, so I, 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 and George Bush was my governor, so I, Sorry. I was, left <laughs> he had no child left behind, but he left me behind. Anyway. <laughs> but I just make up words and just like go with George W. Bush. So, but what, how much of this wage disparity could be attributed to discrimination? Um, because someone doesn't get hired because of their sex or their race or ethnicity. Um, but that's what economists have largely used this for. Um, I'll show you a graphic figure. I'll come back to that in a second, but I'll show you another. Uh, this is an example from economics. So let's imagine that, uh, that, that you have men are making a certain amount of wages over here on the y-axis and women are making a certain amount of wages uh, over here on the y-axis with the same years of schooling and that there is this disparity um, between men and women in wages. Um, what, uh, we do, what we can do with Oaxaca blinder decomposition methods is identify this disparity and then, um, uh, and then, uh, uh, then identify what could be explained based off of the composition. How much of this gap can be explained on, on observable characteristics based on the composition of the sample? And whatever is left unexplained, it's due to something else. 
like discrimination, like stigma, or when, when used in courts, uh, it's, it's the lawyer's job to tell me what else could it be. And if I can go to the data set and prove them wrong, then it, it, teases, it still remains that discrimination and stigma are an important factor here. I think that this is an underutilized tool in public health. I, it's used heavily in uh, labor economics and health and, and labor economics. But I think it's really underutilized in public health. And there's just been a few studies that have uh, that have uh, used this in relation to what I'm going to be doing today. One is on wage disparities between LGBTQ adults and their heterosexual uh, peers. Um, this one looks at mental health disparities between employed and unemployed uh, workers. Um, and the, uh, the closest study to do what I've done here today is in uh, Northern Sweden, where they uh, decompose mental health disparities between sexual minorities and heterosexual adults in Northern Sweden. And Sweden is a very different country than the US, uh, generally more accepting and tolerant of, uh, of uh, sexual and gender minority identities. Um, and in this case, in this example, most of the disparity was explained by observable characteristics between 64 and 74%, leaving about a quarter um, of the mental health disparity in Northern Sweden unexplained. And what I'm gonna present is that it's worse here in the United States. It's that, that unexplained gap is much, is, is much larger. So um, the two different data sources that I, that I use um, are uh, uh, two CDC surveys. Um, they have trade-offs with each other. The first is the uh, National Health Interview Survey in 2015 to 2018, and the second is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System between the same years, 2015 through 2018. Um, so we were intentional in using the same years and as many of the same observed characteristics across each survey. Um, there are differences. The NHIS is an in-person interview uh, conducted annually. So this is when someone comes to your home and sits with you for about four hours to ask questions about your health, uh, your access to care, your health services utilization, and the same thing for a random child in the household if there is a child present. Um, you can see the sample sizes here. This is a more um, exhaustive survey. Um, so they ask more questions, meaning that, that they, have, they only have time and money to, for fewer participants. So that's why the sample sizes for sexual minorities are smaller in this data set. The behavioral risk factor surveillance system, it's a telephone survey. It's, uh, it's bigger, but it asks fewer questions. The trade-off is, is that we know what state people live in in the BRFIS, in the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. So we know whether <laughs> state environments, state policies uh, 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 may influence some of the mental health disparity. Um, there are trade-offs across the two different data sets. Um, the outcomes that we're using are on mental health. Um, I'm open to other suggestions, whether we should also look at physical health or chronic disease and uh, conditions. Um, happy to chat uh, after the talk if there are other ideas. Um, but right now we're starting off uh, with two different mental health measures. In the uh, NHIS, we rely on uh, the K6 scale, which asks how often in the past 30 days did you feel sad, nervous, restless, or fidgety? Um, and we can scale this up and uh, identify people with moderate to severe psychological distress or severe psychological distress. And this is a pretty good uh, measure of, uh, of non-specific uh, psychological distress um, that predicts depression, anxiety, mood disorders, and even mortality for people with severe psychological distress. The second measure we're using is frequent mental distress. And this is uh, in the purpose, it's just one question. How uh, often in the past month uh, was your mental health not good? And if the person said 14 or more days, the CDC calls this frequent mental distress. So two different mental health outcomes and two different data sets. And so um, the way that decomposition works in, uh, uh, in this scenario is that we, we run a regression uh, for, uh, for sexual minorities, run a regression controlling for everything listed down here, demographic uh, characteristics, uh, health outcomes, uh, including chronic health conditions, is, I think a battery of eight to 10. Like, uh, do you have, have you ever been diagnosed with cancer, diabetes, asthma, um, and, and others, access to medical and mental health care, health insurance status. Um, but we run a regression model, restricted to sexual minorities, 
controlling for as many observable characteristics as we can, save those coefficients, run a regression model with just heterosexuals, controlling for everything listed here, save those coefficients, then predict the outcome for sexual minorities using the coefficients from the heterosexual population to predict what should the mental health outcome be had sexual minorities been treated like heterosexuals. And that makes up the explained portion. Whatever is left, whatever the residual is left in that mental health disparity is unexplained uh, 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 and, and could, be, could be due to something else not listed here. And that's something else. It can be discrimination. It can be stigma. It can be uh, not coming out to your provider or to your family, but it could be something else not listed here. Questions? Okay, now I'll show you some results. I'm gonna skip this. Um, but in both data sets, sexual minorities, they're generally younger. They have, they have higher levels of educational attainment, but lower household incomes and they're less likely to be married or have a child in, in the household. And this is pretty consistent across a variety of data sets. Um, but here are the results from the Oaxaca Blinder decomposition. So the way to read this, and this is for moderate to severe psychological distress and severe, psycho and severe psychological distress, first for gay and lesbian adults. About 20% of heterosexual adults have moderate to severe psychological distress and 30% of uh, gay and lesbian adults have moderate to severe psychological distress, meaning that there's this 10 percentage disparity between uh, sexual minorities and their straight peers. And after uh, running decomposition methods, controlling for everything listed at the bottom um, uh, of this gap, about half can be explained by what's listed here, and about half is unexplained, meaning about 48% of this disparity is not explained by the observables that we can control for listed here at the bottom. Meaning that almost half of this disparity could be due to discrimination, stigma, or something else. I'm willing to acknowledge that there's a lot of things we don't ask in these different data sets. You can see the results for severe distress uh, further down the slide. Uh, let me get through bisexuals and I'll come to Michael. And so here are bisexual adults comparing them to heterosexuals. Um, similar pattern, 20% uh, of heterosexuals have moderate to severe psychological distress. 48% um, of bisexual adults in the NHIS have uh, severe to psychological distress, leaving this very large gap, uh, 28 percentage points. Um, and about 55% of this uh, remains unexplained away by these observables here. Um, and you can see that they're the results for severe psychological distress. I promise I'll get to you. <laughs> I just want to also provide some evidence from a larger data set where we know what state people live in. And so we still haven't added in different state policies and, and things like the unemployment rate or things that could impact frequent mental distress. Um, but when we even just put um, an identifier on where people live, what state people live, uh, we can see that 11% of gay and lesbian adults um, are reporting frequent mental distress. Twice as many of gay and lesbian adults are reporting frequent mental distress. And about six, even when, when controlling for state of residence, still a majority of this disparity remains unexplained. Um, and the bisexual uh, adults in the BRFIS are very similar in finding. I'm going to leave one up here for you to, to digest. Uh, but Michael, I was, thank you. I was curious as to if there have been any ways of Codifying or like like adding in to your deep composition, like um like discrimination and its creative formats. And I I'm not sure the best way of doing it. So maybe it's survey or something of that sort. But I was curious as, as if you found any way of doing so. So this is why I'm sort of taking this on the on the road trip and the, uh, <laughs> yeah. like I'm looking for a data set where we ask. Have you been discriminated based off your race? Have you been discriminated based off your sexual orientation or your gender identity? Have you been discriminated based off your sex? Um, because we don't we don't have those in these big CDC data sets. And one of my recommendations is we need to start asking about experiences of discrimination in our national health surveys. But until we do, 
It's like, so have this, you is thought a, about this is the workaround. The older modules where Kamara Jones had the reactions to race in the Bifrus from oh. when she was at the CDC, they're older now because they stopped doing it after she left the CDC. But no, I didn't know these. Were um, there, there's a module that was called reactions to race and it measured discrimination across a, a good set of states, but the data is going to be old now. That's. Uh, I think NIH <clears throat> had a supplement at one point for a short period of time. I'm sorry, the NHIS okay. also had a supplement that asked about experiences of discrimination, I think. I can't remember what In recent years? years? Um, 2018, maybe? Okay. 2019, so that's terribly old, but it was like a small brief supplement that was added. Okay. I can't remember what year, but I feel like I saw it. Okay, I need to, uh, if it's older, the one problem is, is that we don't ask, our, we, we don't, we give state, in the breakfast, we give states the option to run modules, including experience of uh, discrimination modules, mm -hmm. including the SOGI module. And so if, if it's before 2014, we don't know a person's sexual orientation, yeah, yeah. but there are back there are ways that we can try to tease at some of this. So uh, there's a couple of things I want to say. One is I've tried to use the Peters Belson method, but I always it never gets funded in grants because you, you never have the perfect data. The, <laughs> the, the unexplained thing is always going to have stuff that you just couldn't measure. So I'm, I'm impressed that you got it like through this far because I never really get to use it. I guess the one thing I want to say is one of our presenters um, this semester was John Jackson at Hopkins. Um, and he's actually mm -hmm. developing methods around decomposition. So I definitely think you should look at some of his work because I think he's trying to, he's extending um, some of this, like I know Peter, uh, I call it Peter's Belson, it's yes. the same method. Yes. Um, but he's sort of extending some of this methodology in the health equity space. That's great. At Hopkins? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. A couple of questions. Yes. Like the, I actually have a comment. It's, um, it's about like the midlife in the United States has like really good data on um, sexual minorities and you could actually apply the Oaxaca blinder decomposition just to kind of example, because they actually collected um, everyday discrimination scale and you can look at attribution of discrimination mm. and see how much it explains. Midlife in the US? Yeah, midlife in the, in the United States. In the United States, Midas, right? Yeah, yeah. Midas, right. Oh, Midas, yes, yes, yes. Um, then the other question is about what, what I've been struggling with with this particular method um, is that there's a, assumptions that are kind of being made here in terms of like, the residual, right? And when we think about income, access to healthcare that's being controlled oftentimes in these methods, these are oftentimes byproducts of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of adjusting mm -hmm. for that, you're really also adjusting for some components of discrimination mm -hmm. given how multidimensional discrimination is. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of like a question in terms of like, have you mm -hmm. thought about that in terms of like what, then are you looking to adjust to fully explain that residual? It's, uh, I love this question. This is something that's been coming up more in the literature. It's like, why are you controlling for race and ethnicity? It's like, because these are proxies, these are the best proxies we have for racism in the United States. It's, uh, I agree. And it's like, I, I with, the, with this method, which is not perfect and it can be problematic, I, I approach this trying to be careful, but trying to also using the best available toolkit that we have without, with, with, with just limited data. I wonder yeah. if it would be worth you getting the restricted data set where you could get like zip codes. Yeah. Because then you could put in some measures of structural racism using census data that's more, that's at a lower level than state, right? Because state is so far removed. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes from individual lived experiences. And so my goal with this project in this paper is to try to use a variety of, of data sources to offer a range of what, this, what, what, how much does discrimination really matter? Um, whether it's, yeah, bringing Midas, others have, uh, have recommended the ad health data set that might have some uh, discrimination measures, um, but even bringing in, we can, we can definitely bring in some, I wanna say the, uh, the, the city level files in the Burfis we could do some uh, exploring with uh, zip codes and bring in some of those uh, social vulnerability index indices and other measures of, uh, of zip code level. Uh, and Rachel Hardiman has proposed some nice uh, measures of structural racism that just use census data. So like if you have someone's zip code, you can- Rachel and I went to school together. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I can definitely, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, there is a data set called All of Us research program. Yeah. Um, it's, who is it that you're telling me? About? No, it's probably Stephanie. Oh, Stephanie, yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, um, I know it's very not representative of 
national population, um, but they do have some questions specific to um, the reason for discrimination in everyday life. So like, they will ask for um, the question I'm referring to is, what do you think is the main reason for these experiences? Um, prior to that, they have like a list of statements. Like, you're treated with less courtesy than these those um, than other people are. And the reason for discrimination would be like gender, race, age, and so on and so forth. And they have a pretty, what like as an outsider of like, like as someone who is not familiar with this research, um, and I think they have a really comprehensive questions about like their gender and sex and life. I have three minutes left. I will I'm stick sorry. around. I will stick around. I promise afterwards for uh, for your, your feedback and suggestions. I just want to wrap up with some final thoughts because uh, I think that, uh, so I talk about, this is my research. Um, I've said, you know, we made major victories. Things are not perfect. And see, these are some of the things I'm worried about. Headlines like this coming out of, the, out of Tennessee, headlines like this coming out of North Carolina, Mississippi, this next legislative session is not going to be great at the state level. We're going to see a rampant of uh, LGBT, anti-LGBT policies. The last thing I want to bring up, and I want you to really think about moving forward in health and access to care, um, is the role of religion and religious protections and freedoms and access to care for LGBTQ populations. So the Trump administration created this new uh, division within the Office of Civil Rights called Con the, the Division of Conscience and Religious Freedom. This is where you can now go file a federal complaint with the Department of Health and Human Services at the Office of Civil Rights. And this is the office that desegregated hospitals in the 60s. Um, this is the, the office that protects uh, discrimination in, uh, against sex, disability, and language. But now, under the Trump administration, um, we've seen um, uh, we're a new website and, and division where people can file a federal complaint if they feel that their religious views and religious religious views um, were violated uh, in healthcare settings. Um, so, am I am I if they feel that their facility is requiring them to uh, prescribe gender affirming hormones, for instance, gender affirming care that's against their religion, they can go here. And this is important because I think this is the next Supreme Court case. A couple of years ago, the Supreme Court took up wedding cakes. This year, they're taking up website, de yeah. website development. Website development. This is what I'm really worried about. Will the Supreme Court take up this issue and allow doctors to deny patients based off of their conscience or religious freedom? In the first few years, uh, we uh, you can see the, the director who uh, came from the, the, the I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I don't have time to talk about how it's not me. <laughs> and so, and, and so uh, I had a colleague do a Freedom of Information Act, and there were 50 complaints in that first year. 90% of them were on reproduct sexual reproductive health, where uh, physicians felt like they were being forced to prescribe contraceptions or to implant IUDs that was against their religious views. The other 10% were on gender affirming care um, where, where doctors felt like they were being forced uh, to prescribe uh, hormones or to, uh, or to uh, treat uh, gender minorities uh, in, in healthcare settings. This is gonna be the, I, I, I worry that this will be eventually be a Supreme Court case that <laughs> extends from wedding cakes and websites to people's actual lives and their, and their health and, and access to care. Um, I wanna thank you all for inviting me today. I really have enjoyed my day. I've got meetings lined up with a few of you. Um, and I'll, I think I have a break uh, following this. So I'll stick around and chat with anyone who wants to uh, talk about LGBTQ health and policy. Um, thank you.